Have any of you ever cooked with feel? In other words, no instructions, no recipe. You just go by, <laughs> you just go by feel. I've done it a few times, quite a few times actually. Sometimes it turns out good, sometimes not so good. Um, I remember once, probably more than once, because I didn't learn the first few times, I don't think. But I remember once I was, I actually wanted to make deep fried pierogies. So I uh, put the pierogies in the pan, filled the pan full of oil, turned it on. It, it actually sounds easy, doesn't it? Deep fried pierogies, it doesn't sound like it's hard to make. It's, you know, how hard is it to put a pierogies in oil and fry them? So anyways, I'm going along my merry way here in the kitchen. I fill the pan up, have the oil, or the pierogies in there. I turn the heat up and then just wait for it to cook. And eventually it turned nice and golden brown. And then I took them out and they tasted terrible. Anyone know why? <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> so all the oil actually had saturated into the pierogies. It tasted like canola oil, it was nasty, but needless to say, I ate them anyways. <laughs> well, I did it probably once or twice more after I clued into going, you actually have to heat the oil up so that you actually sear the flavor in. Isn't that interesting? The first version, it ends up looking the same as the second version but the taste is dramatically different. Many Christians struggle similarly with walking in the Spirit. They are stepping in and out of His leading, and the result is a very off-tasting kind of life. The Bible says if you live in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. And a lot of times we wonder, why, why don't I feel good as a Christian? And I have to ask myself, well, I wonder, is it because I'm in and out of his will? Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. <coughs> and then I th thought back to the Old Testament, and I asked myself, is it possible to live in error without having wind? willful, sinful intentions. Should I say it again? Because that sounded like I was mumbling. Is it possible to live in error without having willful, sinful intentions? It's not a trick question. Well, it is, isn't it? Because the Old Testament said for the unknown sin. They had a sacrifice for that. So I think there is occasion we can actually have that off tasting life and actually be kind of clueless as to why even and not willfully trying to go after doing the wrong thing but actually inadvertently doing stupid oh i guess that's where the term came from <laughs> so why do we have the bible we have the bible to keep us on track if we live a good life in christ it is worthwhile to be fully equipped and I thought it's because I personally never have liked the feeling, well, I get sick easy on these rides. So like even the swings that go round and round at the circus, I would get sick on those even. So I don't want my life to resemble a roller coaster where you're up one day, down the next day, and it's, it's all over the map. And something I thought where I got my original illustration from is because the Old Testament was rep the Holy Spirit was re represented by oil. And in 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says, David stood among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came on him powerfully from that day on. And something that's interesting is the Hebrew term translated Messiah and the Greek term for Christ both mean the, anyone know? 
talking about oil, we're talking about David being anointed with oil, the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, both in Greek and Hebrew, mean the anointed one. The Holy Spirit's vessel. Acts 10, 38. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the Holy Spirit in him gave him power to do good. It allowed him to heal all who were oppressed. And a passage that I think we all know when we think about Jesus' ministry was this. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. It's the good news. The Holy Spirit comes to fill us and in some cases there is some searing that goes on <laughs> and we are sealed with the power of the Holy Ghost to go around to what? to do good to help the broken hearted to minister to those that can't see a way out of their situation When you have the Holy Spirit's anointing on you, you go around doing good because it's a program that the church started? No, because it becomes part of your DNA. Healing, helping, rebuilding, and restoring that which was destined for destruction. And I thought, what's, what's our default? Because most people you talk to don't say, I want to be a villain. Most people you talk to say, I'm a good person. And I thought, does that slippery th thinking come into our Christian walk where we can just say, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, man. Think, look at me, man. I read my Bible, I pray. I am a good person. What's the tendency when you say that? <laughs> the sad thing is, Paul said, there's nothing good in me. <laughs> and we say, we're a good person. And what, what is the natural default when you say, when you, your premise is, I'm good. Your premise is that you start doing things out of your own goodness. And when you start doing things out of your own goodness, you have a limit. You only can do so much good before you say, hey, I, I can't do anymore, this is enough. Our default can be to be self-performance, self-reliance. But it is only when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill and overflow from our being to the point of ignition that power overflows out of our very being. In other words, the Spirit of God starts to spill out of you, the vessel. So really, no Christian in their right mind would say, I don't want more power in my life. And the devil knows that. He knows that the power of God is actually more effective than our own goodness. He knows that the power of God doesn't have a fuel gauge that says empty. I'm done. He never has a lack. He's never at a loss. So what does the devil have to do? The devil, being true to his nature, has to say, let's distort the truth. Let me try to see if I can slip some lies in there. You know what he's done? He has tried to con leaders into dismissing the importance of being filled and fueled by the Spirit of God. If you've been around the church any amount of time, you know that it's a very touchy thing to talk about the Holy Spirit. And some denominations don't want to talk about it at all. Because they're like, uh, that's too iffy. That's a little on the crazy scale. And I have to think, well, that's one of the Godheads. How could you say that about the Godhead? So if I sat down 
with anyone in this room and I said, guess what? I can cut your utility bill in half by giving you extra power for free. I bet most people would say, where can I sign? <laughs> I want free power. This utilities are killing me. But the devil knows that the Holy Spirit is offering Christians free power. So he plays videos in our heads. So if we're keeping with that power analogy, he'll play videos in your heads of people being electrocuted, <laughs> of power lines falling down on houses. And what does he do when it comes to the Holy Spirit? He says, to Christians and to preachers and to anyone that is seeking God, he's going to say the same thing. It doesn't matter who. That was for back then. Have you ever heard that? Because that is a theology that's out there. That was for back then. But that doesn't line up with Scripture because Scripture says God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just read that David, even in the Old Testament, was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was a changed man from that day on. He was no longer the same person. Well, the devil will say that was for back then, or he'll say, that is way too freaky. It's too fanatical. That's going too far. Or, and in my case, this is very true. He would say, that's not your personality. And in my case, I would be like, you're right. I don't like weird things. I don't like surprises, especially in church. I'm like, I like things. I am very, very comfortable with predictable services. <laughs> and I think a lot of us would have to admit, we don't, we don't want to be stretched out of our comfort zone. Like, that's a little weird, man. That's going too far. But by us saying that, we're saying, God, I limit you to this point and this point, no further. And a, and a lot of it's this. We, you know what? We want things to be in, in order. We want things to be dignified. I don't want to look like an idiot is the real answer. <laughs> but Paul said, I'm willing to be made a fool of for Christ. And he's seen so many powerful things happen because he allowed the Holy Spirit to guide his actions and his thoughts and his steps and his words. Maybe we should be asking this. What truth does the enemy know that he's trying to keep from us? Because he knows very well what God is made up of. You guess where he came from, remember? Yeah, he fell like a bolt of lightning from heaven. And I thought, really, if we're honest, most of us, if we were sat down and asked, what's your thoughts on the Holy Spirit? The topic would be probably pretty vague and the answers would be a little weird if we can go, if we gathered them all together and just kind of brainstormed. Effective living and leading comes from having a great coach that keeps you from making fatal mistakes. And we need the Holy Spirit to lead us along to the finish line. God wants us to finish the race in victory, not despair. I don't think the last words he wants us to say are, thank God I barely made it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here, God. I barely made it. This Christian life has sucked everything out of me, man. I made it to the finish line. And he's like, you are a loser. <laughs> I had blessings for you. I had miracles for you. But you would not because you wanted to control me. I have to be honest. A lot of times that's me. I don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to try things that are going to maybe not work out. <laughs> and yet, if we, have, if we limit our thinking to the Bible, we don't have many options. <laughs> He's like... If you love me, you will 
follow me, you'll do what I did, and you'll leave the consequences to me. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the race, if we can say, well, God, I did what you did. I said what you said. And if we don't have the same results, guess what? I'm not Jesus. He just said, do what I did. Follow my path. Leave the rest to him. Because he's got his role too, right? The responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God. God will do his part. But a lot of times we don't do our part because we're too scared to actually step out and actually be a little possibly looked down at or laughed at or whatever. I don't know. Okay, here we are. Acts 19.2. We were going to get here eventually. I knew it. Acts 19.2. Paul is cruising along. He's driving himself a 1976 Toyota Corolla. Good on fuel. He comes to these people and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they're like, hmm, interesting question. And they answered him honestly. They looked him in the face and said, Paul, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> we don't know. We don't. We don't know what you're talking about. We have been raised in a conservative church, bro. We don't know what you're talking about. Then I said, "Don't you feel better? There's other people out there that are not sure about the Holy Spirit." <laughs> Keeping people uninformed is the best form of control, isn't it? I don't have to fight you. I don't have to wrestle with you. I don't have to manipulate you. If I just keep you uninformed, and I'm not talking about politics, if I just keep you uninformed, I have the best form of control known to man. You don't know the truth. You aren't informed. So I don't have to use any other method than a lie. And I thought if we were in a room, actually, I'll give you a better illustration, probably one you've heard your whole life, who knows. You know how they train elephants? Anyone? You know that they tie them up when they're small with a chain to a little peg, and they can't get loose. But guess what? When they're big, they could easily, easily rip that peg out, but they never do. Think about it. Now put it in realistic terms. I'm a Christian. I've been serving the Lord. I got saved when I was 18, or just about 18, like literally a few days before I was 18. The devil has done some things in my life that have convinced me this truth doesn't work. What do I do? Nine out of 10 times, that Christian is gonna get conditioned to never opposing that. And saying, I don't care, devil. Again, what does the scripture say? You know what? I have to say sometimes, devil, I don't care. I don't care. I'm an idiot. So you can keep slapping me with this and saying, see, this doesn't change. See, this isn't going to get better. See, I have this. And I'm going to say every time, well, I'm going to be like that woman that Jesus talks about, that she kept knocking on the door of the man that could help her. And eventually, he didn't get up and help her because he liked her. He got up and helped her because she wouldn't go away. And that's what Jesus said. Don't give up and don't give in to this system. Keep knocking at the door. Don't let your kids go to hell. Don't let whatever's he's telling you, this ain't going to change. I have this. Don't give up. Keep being a thorn in the flesh. Why? Because he said so. He said, keep knocking. Keep asking. So I'll just leave the illustration I have here alone. <laughs> the devil wants Christians to experience this is actually kind of funny, but it's true. <laughs> the, 
The devil wants Christians to experience a lethargic, dead religion. A type of church where people are satisfied to live defeated lives and never look for hope beyond our daily needs. I didn't say not look for hope. I said look for hope beyond our daily needs. God's got a bigger picture. And I love how this so applies to the canola soap for all these. <laughs> we can have that kind of a life where we have some of the Holy Spirit, but it don't taste that good. I don't know who said this quote, but there's a guy out there that I should be giving credit to, but I can't remember his name, so here goes me taking credit for it. He said, there's a lot of Christians that have just enough of Jesus to be miserable. <laughs> and I think we have to get to the place where we don't need to sound like professors. I love what Billy Graham said. He said, my ministry changed when I actually opened the Bible, started reading it for the first time and believed what it said. Instead of letting all these other people, oh, that actually isn't for now. No, that actually, we can't believe that anymore. Oh, this this is, they got fancy words for it. I don't even know what they are, but I'm like, I'm just naive enough to believe that God's bigger than we are. And he can do what he wants, but we have to be willing to step out of the boat like Peter and say, God, I really feel overwhelmed by this circumstance. Things don't look good. I'm going to step out and obey you. <laughs> the enemy is a liar. He will stop at nothing to distort the truth and keep us living below what Christ has for us and what he wants us to experience. And you know what I love is this. The people Paul was talking to here in Acts 19, they were Christians. They were Christians. They were believers. And Paul wanted to present them with a gift, with a key that would allow them freedom. If you wish to have all the life that Christ's death and resurrection bought for you, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. And you know what? I don't know if there's a formula. I know what Paul did. It says he laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. But I think the first thing is this. We have to be honest with ourselves. Do I want that? Do I want the Holy Spirit's working in my life? Do I want that kind of power? The temple you live in, your body. Did you know when you become a Christian, it says you receive the seal of the Holy Spirit? Did you know that? It says you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I like to look at it this way. It says you have a seal. Just like when you bring a propane tank in, they say, has this thing been certified? Oh yeah, no, you can hold 150 pounds pressure in there. Well, I like to think approved vessel for containing the Holy Spirit. You become a Christian, there's a seal put on you saying, approved vessel, the Holy Spirit can dwell here. Upon Christ coming into your life, you were transformed according to Scripture. And now your body is equipped and approved to hold the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like when you fill up to the gas station, you got to say, fill it up. <laughs> and the good thing is, humans leak. And you, that's a good thing. is You can leak it all over your family, all over the people you come in contact with. The funny thing is about the Holy Spirit, when you face things in life that are just a bit off, no, way off. Like this last week, I kept thinking to myself, man, what is it? Is, is it a full moon? Are people going crazy or what? But when you have the Holy Spirit living in you, I, I find it very interesting because I want to write certain kind of emails to certain kind of people. And the Holy Spirit says, don't do that, Sam. I'm like, oh, I wanted to do that. 
I know how to play this game really well. And the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. That ain't you. That's not how you do things. So I sulked for a while, and I obeyed. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's the Holy Spirit. That's actually following the leading of the Holy Spirit. When he says, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to guide you. It's not about winning. It's not about looking good. It's about following in my footsteps and following what I said in Isaiah 61. Why am I here? I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. I'm here to restore. I'm here to rebuild. You want to make yourself look good and look right. Sam, wake up. Ouch. I heard it actually. It hurt every time he said that. <laughs> I had some really good emails. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit fills you, it starts. This is what's awesome. When the Holy Spirit fills you, guess what it starts doing? We're so programmed to be work task oriented and performance acknowledgement. I got an A plus, mom. Very good, Johnny. Not that Johnny, but maybe that Johnny too. Who knows? <laughs> Sammy comes home and says, "Guess what, Dad? I got 100% of my spelling. I got some candy." And I'm like, "Way to go, buddy!" But the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, works a little different. When you receive the Holy Spirit, what does He do? He starts by what? Sending you out on a mission. Go out there. I want you to get your butt kicked by those seven people. No. You know what He does? He says, "Come here." He starts by ministering to you. What? Did, what? Think back, Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. What? Think further back. Jesus said, wait, don't move. Wait for the power. When the Holy Spirit comes, he starts by equipping you. I can't weld today, but if I'm taught, how to weld, I can weld. Do you get it? Why do we burn out? Why do we leave the church? Why do we quit? Oh, now it's starting to make, unfortunately, too much sense. Because I've been doing how much in my own strength? Ouch. Say goodbye to religion. <laughs> it's hard to follow in the footsteps of the Father because he requires all. And he requires something we don't want to give. That's trust. I trust you, Father, that you won't disappoint me, that you won't abandon me, that you won't neglect me, that you won't forget about me, that you won't find something that's better. Isn't that really the truth? The Holy Spirit says, no, I'm here to minister to you first. You're not going to give from yourself. You're going to give from what I give you. Isn't that different? Isn't that a lot easier to do this? I, I didn't. This isn't from me. Here. I'm giving you from what he gave me. That changes everything from self-performance to God flowing through us. And honestly, it takes a lot of the responsibility off our shoulders saying, I will do this for you. But I can't. I'm just human. I'm just a guy. But you know what? When we say, God, here I am. I want everything this book says is for me. I want to cash in the coupons. I'm at the cash register and I'm like, I got all these coupons, God. I need to cash in a few. You know what I'm talking about? And he says, no problem. They're all good here. You know what the best payoff for any Christian is when you're so full of the Holy Spirit that it starts leaking out of you into circumstances that you wouldn't normally think about. And then you start seeing it and you're like, wow, that's weird. Do you know what religion is in and of itself? Religion in and of itself, if you look at it, is an attempt to control God. <laughs> to tame his power, and to minimize his involvement in our lives. And I have one thing to say to that. He is not a force to reckon with. I want to read a little part of uh, 
Chronicles of Narnia, because I've listened to that probably about 10 trillion times with my kids. There's a part in Chronicles of Narnia, well, I'll just read it. It's Sue's, uh, who is it? No, it's Jill. And Jill is with Aslan, the lion. And the lion is Jesus. The lion from the tribe of Judah. Just so you know that it's actually somewhat biblically based. Are you thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do it? Said Jill. The lion answered only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at his motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well ask the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise to, to do, uh, no. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come, said Jill? I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. She said, do you eat girls? <laughs> she, he said, I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. And it didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I'm not come. Can I? No. I'm not come. I obviously take that wrong. Oh, yeah. I can't come and drink, said Jill. And he looked at her and said, then you'll die. Oh dear, <laughs> said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. And he looked at her and said, there is no other stream. God is not the kind of God we can control, we can manipulate. And if he is, you may want to reassess. <laughs> he ain't God. He's something we created. The Holy Spirit in your life is soothing. And you know what? So many well-intentioned Christian people are missing out. They are giving and struggling to do good, but it is from a place of emptiness. And we need the Holy Spirit to fill our tank. You know how many times I've heard this from leaders that have failed? They've fallen into sexual sin. They've fallen because they embezzled from the church. Many different reasons, but almost the common denominator of most of them was this. I was giving from a place of emptiness. And that automatically tells you there was no relationship with God. That had slipped away and had been traded for a program, traded for a system. Really all God asks is for us to come as little children. I'm honest. Dad, did you get me the Nerf gun for my birthday? Dad, is it is that is that a Nerf gun in there? I want to know. Did you get me the Nerf gun? Daddy, are you gonna watch me? 
I got some people that are ganging up on me. Daddy, are you gonna watch me? I've got some people that say they're my friends, but they're planning things against me. Daddy, are you gonna help me? My family's turning their back on me. Daddy, are you gonna help me? He says, not only will I help you, I will fill you with love that you can't make up on your own. Those enemies, those betrayers, those people that have used you will be in shock because the love that flows out of you isn't ignorance. It's actually agape love. It's the love of the Father that says, I can overcome evil with good because I have the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I thought, I wonder, I just wonder if sometimes our sense of unworthiness, because Paul said, I don't feel worthy. What did John say? I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I wonder if the sense of unworthiness is the beginning of us pursuing him more and wanting more of him. It is never selfish to accept a gift from God. Rather, it's really unwise not to. <laughs> John 14, 16 to 18. Jesus said, I will send you an advocate, the spirit of truth. He will live in you and guide you. I will not leave you as orphans. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, he is going to fight for you. He is going to open your eyes to your potential. So many of us live way below our potential. Why? Because we're our own worst critic, I guess. But God says, I've got more for you. And I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Trust me. He is going to deal with the condemnation from the past failures. He is going to counsel you. This is everything he says he's going to do. He is going to counsel you. He is going to teach you about truth. He is going to confirm the validity about Christ in your heart. He is going to carry you across the finish line if needed. You don't have to crawl. He will carry you across the finish line if needed. This life isn't fair. No one in their right mind would ever say to you, this life is fair. This life is definitely not fair. There's many things that happen to people here that are not fair. The one thing that's guaranteed, the Holy Spirit will carry you. I will take you as a mother covers her children. I'll hold you in my arms. I'll protect you. I'll hold you near my heart. That I can guarantee. I can't guarantee that this life's going to be easy. That would be a lie. As Paul talked to the believers, it became more and more clear that they were dedicated and eager. They were people that were trying to follow after the heart of God. So in Acts 19, Paul goes on to explain that yes, we repent. Yes, we get baptized. And we need to receive the Holy Spirit Verse 11 of 19. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul did some pretty extraordinary things. But it was through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through slip of hand. Verse 14. Sometimes people like the magic of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have the heart for God. 
And this is a good passage to remind those people. <laughs> you know what? The Holy Spirit is real. God is real. But God is not a fool. Verse 14, do not test God and the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, we see the seven sons of Shiva. They learned a very tough lesson that day. They loved the magical part of the Holy Spirit and the miracles. And when they tried to cast out some evil spirits, the devil said, <clears throat> Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And he beat the crap out of them. And they went away naked. I think the cool thing here is we need to come humbly before the Lord. <laughs> There's all kinds of weird things that happen in the church. But you know what? We need to keep our thinking on one hand open, on the other hand based in the Bible. When the move and the power of the Holy Spirit, let's not forget that it must be motivated by what? Holiness. There is no counterfeit for the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything less than full submission to Christ's will. And ultimately the motivation is this. John said, I must decrease, he must increase. I want to be more like Christ. Christ has said, be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can fulfill my purposes. God wants to bless us with his spiritual blessings and this does not mean a life will be problem free but with the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit it is on you on you every day life will be free from the stranglehold this world tries to inflict on everyone who walks this earth really that's the difference some people are held to this earth by the cares and worries and the anxieties of this world and others live here, but they're not bound here. This earth is not home. It is more like a transfer station. Christ is preparing us for heaven. John 16, 13 to 15. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. That's Jesus talking. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me that he will make known to you. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Jesus says, come into my presence. Don't stand on the outer fringes where the oil is lukewarm and you are saturated by the world and its cares. Come into the Holy Spirit fire and experience the power, purpose, pleasure, and fulfillment that comes from running on Holy Spirit power. Paul faced death. This, before I read this all off, this may not encourage some of you. <laughs> Paul experienced death, beatings, betrayals, persecution, abandonment, desertion, hunger, imprisonment, floggings, shipwreck, cold, heartbreak, and more. But he was so full of the Holy Spirit, all these things could not extinguish the flame of the Spirit in his soul. If your tank is fueled by the power of God in your life, You're unstoppable. We need to remind ourselves of this. Because what happens? Things happen in life that seem unjust, seem unfair. I've had good Christian people say to me, if this, whatever it was, happened to me, I'm afraid I could never go to church again because I couldn't believe we have to be honest and realistic and actually live in the truth, not a fantasy. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Therefore, 
the world had no grip on him. But when we are fueling our own tank, everything matters that's around us. Paul had his eyes on the Lord. He had his vision set on heaven. He said, I want to finish the race. And he looked that way. Now I've asked...